Good afternoon, guys. How are you? All right, we have a very special program for you. Seated in front of you, are a, I know you guys have been talking about veterans in your classroom. These are all veterans. And then we also have General Mukiyama, who's sitting right in the middle, who is going to give you a little Veterans Day message. But before we get started, we have a group of gentlemen in blue shirts, and they are called the Arlingtons, and they are going to sing the Star Spangled Banner to get my assembly started. So, what I need you to do is you can stand up. Oh, say can you see students of Hanson School, thank you for inviting me here today to talk to you about the meaning of Veterans Day. Before I talk about the importance of Veterans Day, I've been asked to kind of give you some additional brief information about me. I was born and raised in Chicago and graduated from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. I was commissioned as an Army officer through the Reserve Officer Training Corps, or the ROTC program, and I served for five years on active duty. I survived two combat tours, one in Korea and one in Vietnam, and then I served 25 years in the Army Reserve. I also had a 38-year career in business. I have been blessed with a wonderful wife and family, and I'm very active in my church. And today, I'm president of a national faith-based nonprofit organization that serves our military, veterans, and their families. Now, there are three main reasons for events such as the one being conducted here today and throughout the country. First, to remember the sacrifices of our service members and their families. Second, to honor them. And third, to inform future generations, and that means you, the students of Catholic, so that you can fully understand that freedom is indeed not free, but it's paid for by the sacrifice and service of our military and their families. Now the great Roman speaker Cicero once said, poor is the nation that has no heroes, but poorer still is the nation that has heroes and fails to remember and honor them. So today at Patton, we do honor those who fought for us. So who are these citizen patriots? Our veterans have come from every part of our society and from all ethnicities and races, men and women from every state and territory of our great nation. Some were called by our country to serve and some volunteered. And today it's an all-volunteer force. So every day of our lives, we walk among these quiet heroes and heroines. A young police officer recently returned from a second tour of duty in Afghanistan. A grandmother who at 22 years of age went to Vietnam as a young nurse. 
a slow-moving senior citizen at the mall who once stormed a beach at Normandy in World War II. So in our society, some are honored for their money, political power, athletic ability, and television star status. But of all the titles in the world, I think the proudest is that of military veteran, because it refers to someone who is willing to sacrifice everything for America. So in their honor, I quote from the Bible, and it reads, the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Although that was written more than 2,000 years ago, it accurately describes the experience of American veterans of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. For they also fought the good fight, and they finished the race, and they kept faith with America in peace and in war. So it's a privilege for me to share in today's events. I've been retired from the military, from the Army, for many years. And people often ask me what I miss most about the military. And my answer is always the same. And that is, I miss the people. Americans who share the values of selfless service, honor, and dedication to defending our great nation. It is they that I miss the most. Now, part of the tradition of gathering on this national holiday is to honor the patriotism, the concept of patriotism that emphasizes pride and service to our nation. So on such occasions, we proudly display the American flag and we pause to honor all those who have served in defense of our country. We do these things to remind ourselves that the freedom we enjoy was obtained at great cost the payment was made by the sacrifice of the men and women of our armed forces, from the Minutemen of the Revolutionary War all the way to the mountains of Afghanistan today. In World War II on D-Day in June 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Allied Commander and later became President of the United States, said, quote, the eyes of the world are upon you, unquote. The eyes of the world are once again upon our service members today as we fight another threat to democracy and freedom. Our troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all around the globe go bravely into harm's way in the same tradition of our veterans who went before them. So as we look back and feel pride and patriotism, there is also the challenge of tomorrow, and we must look forward and prepare for our future. And these challenges of the future won't be any easier than they were in the past. The demands on those who will stand up to defend the nation will be difficult, and the sacrifices will be great. But there can be no other way if we are to remain blessed with liberty. It is those who serve in our military who will fight on the front lines, and that's what they've always done. The soldier, the sailor, the airmen, the Coast Guardsmen, and the Marine are directly responsible for defending our nation, our Constitution, and our freedom from foreign enemies. And they've done and continue to do their job superbly. If they had failed, we would not be gathered here today as a free nation. So the challenge of our nation is to keep our guard up and our forces strong. We want to be strong because it still remains the best path to continued peace. So we can be thankful today that so many brave Americans and their families are serving in our country, wearing our nation's uniform, to keep alive our heritage of democracy and freedom. And we can be equally thankful to all those veterans, such as those here today, who set the example and paved the way through their dedication, sacrifice, and service. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, so we're going, to, you can ask, we're going to ask the general a question, and then... How old were you when you joined the military? 
Uh, when I joined the military, actually, uh, I was in ROTC in college, uh, so I was uh, 18. How do you move up ranks? How do you move up ranks? You move up ranks by working very hard. Uh, and the important thing is that you study, uh, and just like in school, okay, if you want to get promoted, you have to study so you know the answers. The way you move up in ranks in the military is you work hard, you pay attention to your leaders, and you study. What do the stars mean, and how do you get them? The stars mean I'm a general. Uh, in, during peacetime, the highest you can go is four stars. Uh, one star is a brigadier, two stars is a major general, three stars is a lieutenant general, and four stars is just called a general. So I'm a major general because I have two stars. Where were you stationed? I was stationed, I started out in Fort Benning, Georgia as an infantry officer, then I went to Korea as a platoon leader. I came back to Fort Lewis, Washington, I then went to Vietnam, then I came back to Fort Sheridan, and then I joined the reserve. Do you have any time to have fun? Oh, I have, I have a lot of time to have fun. <laughs> uh, you know, you make, but no matter where you at, no matter where you're at, always have a good sense of humor, uh, because life can be tough sometimes, and a smile can make you feel better. Job in the army. I had a lot of jobs. Uh, mostly, uh, the one that I, the ones I enjoyed the most was I was an infantry officer. So that means I trained for fighting and to lead soldiers. And so, uh, the, the best job I, I've got to say was when I was a company commander in, in Vietnam. It was the most dangerous, but it was also the most fulfilling for me. How did you earn your status? I had great non-commissioned officers. Non-commissioned officers are the sergeants. They're called NCOs. They're the ones who really make the unit operate smoothly. So the answer to your question is I had great NCOs who made me look good. What is it like to command troops? Uh, it's very challenging to command troops. Uh, the thing you have to remember is that when you're commanding troops, uh, especially when you're in combat, if you make a mistake, it costs lives. And that's the most important responsibility I had as an officer in the United States Army. Do you have any friends in different groups of the armed forces? The, the military, you know, it's like a family. Uh, we have a lot of sibling arguments, you know, between the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force and the Army. But that's like within the family. If somebody from outside, a non-veteran, comes and says something, uh, we all band together. So we we all work together. Have you ever worked in a tank or a plane? Have you ever worked in a tank or a plane? Yes. Uh, answer is yes to both. Uh, I have driven a uh, Abrams tank, which is an M1 tank. That's the most modern one. And I have also I was a paratrooper, so as I mentioned before, I have been in airplanes that I wanted to jump out of. So. Did you keep a diary or journal in the military? Uh, did I write a diary or journal in the military? No, I didn't, and I, I kind of regret that, but I really didn't have time uh, to do that. Um, the time that I always spent, especially when I was in combat, was just kind of thinking of what I needed to do to lead my troops. Uh, the rest of the time, uh, you know, you train so hard, you just want to chill out at the end of the day. You, know, you don't want to uh, sit there and, and write. General, is there one person who was most influential to you in the military? Is there one person who was most influential to me in the military? Um, I would say, and this will surprise you all, it was my wife. Uh, yes, because and the, reason, the reason for that is that my wife supported me in the military. I could not have done what I did in the military without my wife supporting me. And that's why when you think of our military, always remember their families, because the families sacrifice as much as these.
service member. What is your favorite thing to do in free time? Favorite thing to do in free time is I'm very active in my church, so uh, I like to volunteer and serve others. If I can serve others, I'm, I'm pretty happy. How many soldiers are you in charge of? Well, uh, it depended at what level you're talking about. Uh, the, my last position, I was the Deputy Commanding General of Training and Doctrine Command, which was the Army's training headquarters, so all of the training posts reported to us, so conservatively a couple hundred thousand, maybe. What did you wear? What did I wear in the Army? Whatever they told me. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, we had many uniforms, believe me. What do you do um, to train for the Army? Uh, first of all, as a soldier, you have to be physically fit. Okay. So you really have to be in good physical condition. Number two, today the military is very uh, dependent upon, upon knowledge when it comes to computers. And you have to be, you really have to be very smart. So you've got to go to school and you have to get a good education. And the other thing is, which I stress to my soldiers, was you really have to have a good moral code. And the moral code comes from your family, and it comes from your religion, whatever your faith is. Okay? So you need to be strong physically, you need to be strong in terms of your education, and you have to be strong morally. How is your family impacted? How was my family? Well, I've been very blessed. Uh, I have a wonderful wife. Uh, who's put up with me for 43 years, and uh, she gets the gold medal. Uh, I always tell people that she was always higher in rank than I was. But to answer your question, there were so many times I was away when my wife, who is all of four foot ten and weighs about 95 pounds, uh, that's when the blizzard came, okay? So guess who had to get the snowblower up to plow the driveway, because I wasn't home. Uh, we had, uh, our son was a, a pretty, uh, let's say he got into a lot of trouble. And uh, my wife had to take him to the emergency room of the hospital three times. I don't even know where it's at, because I wasn't home at the time. Uh, There's a lot of stress and strain on the family, because I wasn't home for a lot of the time. So guess what? My wife had to be both mom and dad. That's kind of hard. And there's a lot of pressure in that regard. Um, so that's why military families go through a lot. And, and my kids, too. You know, I wasn't there for some of the important things in their lives. I missed some games, you know, in sports, or I missed some recitals. Both, uh, both of our kids played, uh, you know, musical instruments. Uh, and, but I was away on duty, so there's there's a lot of sacrifice the family has to make. How are you selected to be a commander? The army uh, really has a, a pretty uh, good way of selecting commanders. Uh, basically, uh, every year we we get a we get a what's called an efficiency report, and that efficiency report is written by your direct supervisor and that person's supervisor. And they go through a, a complete list of qualifications. Uh, you know, did, uh, did the person perform his job, his or her job well? Did they know their uh, different tasks? How did they carry them out? Did they do them in a timely fashion? Uh, how were they physically? Remember I told you about the physical thing? And so they have this, uh, that type of a thing. And uh, everybody gets one every year. And then when they select people for promotion, they have what are called promotion boards. Uh, and it's not really a piece of wood. A board means a bunch of people who act together like a committee. And they actually look at these efficiency reports. And they're able to select the best ones. And then those people are the ones that they select to be a commander. Can you please describe a typical day of your life while you were serving? Uh, 
that's, you know, there really isn't any typical day, but I can tell you that uh, uh, all of us were in the service. And, and, you know, you get up early in the morning, okay? And it's, it's normally, there's, there's what's called a training schedule. And if the Army kind of sets it all off for you. And you know what you're supposed to be doing on certain, certain times of the day. Uh, but, you know, a typical day, you get up early in the morning, you, you, you ex normally exercise, we had some kind of physical exercise, okay, you have your meal, then you go train, and training means anything. Uh, training could be physically, physical training, it could be training with weapons, it could be marching, it could be working on equipment, so your whole day is really taken up with uh, activity. And then you have, you know, lunch, dinner, and that's pretty much it. Okay. What were the challenges of uh, returning to the United States after serving? Yeah, the question was, what were, what's the challenges of uh, returning to the States after serving? Um, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and so our country at that time, it, now it's going to be hard for you all to believe this, but when we came back from Vietnam, Vietnam was a highly unpopular war. Uh, in our country, and uh, there were people in our country who treated our military extremely bad. That's, I could use other words, but I'm here. And, uh, but it was so bad that we were told not to wear our uniforms in public, if you can believe that. I mean, people were spitting on us, they were calling us names, uh, it was brutal. And so, for my generation, when we came back, there were no parades, there were no welcome home, uh, there were no yellow ribbon things, which we have today. And, and I would tell you that the reason that's happening today is because of our Vietnam generation. Because we swore that when we got to be our age, that that wouldn't happen again to other, other younger soldiers, sailors, marine, airmen coming back. And so uh, it was pretty tough for us when we came back. Now the good news is that if you had a strong family supporting you, and in my case, uh, my church supported me, uh, that made it a lot easier. How did training help you in the Army? You know, the Army uh, has a very fine training system. And all, all the military does, really. Uh, and so it helped me as an individual in life because, you know, the Army system is pretty simple. They basically tell you what they expect you to do. They tell you the standards, and they tell you the circumstances, circumstances under which you're going to do it. And then they measure you. And that's, the, the training is very consistent. Uh, is what I found out in the Army is that if I kept it simple for my soldiers and I explained to them what the task was and I was consistent in what I did and if I was very hard on them, it was very important because life is hard. Life is difficult. And if you don't train hard, you don't learn hard, you don't study hard, you're not going to be successful. What or who inspired you to serve for the U.S.? When I, when I grew up, my older brother was in the Army, so that was kind of uh, an influence. But uh, my background is uh, I'm Japanese-American. My father came from Japan, and I don't know if you've heard of the term samurai, but the samurai were the Japanese warriors. That is part of our culture, our cultural tradition. And in Japan, the samurai uh, in society at the highest level. They were the ones that were respected. Uh, in addition to that, when, when I was a very young young boy, uh, I was in Cub Scouts, and I was in Boy Scouts, and we emphasized God and country, and we emphasized duty and honor. And so all of those match what the Army and the mil all the military services emphasized. And so it was very, very enticing to me. I wanted to do that. How do you feel when you send troops into a combat situation? It is the highest responsibility 
of a person that is in command. Because, see, if, if you're in business, for example, and if your company goes bankrupt, you can, you lose money, but you can we, you can get it back and you can rebuild a new business. But if you're a leader of soldiers in combat, and if you make a mistake, the cost is our nation's highest commodity, and that is the lives of our soldiers. So uh, when I send troops into combat, I never ask them to do anything I wouldn't do. And I was with my soldiers when we went forward. And that's the way you've got to do it as a leader. What was your most challenging task when you served? I wasn't the brightest guy, so I had a lot of challenging tasks, let me put it that way. But um, I think uh, the most challenging really was when I was in combat uh, be because of the responsibility. It was, I, I knew, I, see, I, I never worried about my personal life because I'm a man of faith. And I, I knew that if God was going to take me, I'd be in a better place. I never worried about that. I never once was concerned about being wounded. I was more concerned about doing my job as a commander. So that, that was the toughest uh, thing for me, going into combat. You know, I'd have to plan ahead of time. I, I tried to be days ahead of the enemy in my plan. Uh, and that's what kept me awake. Really, I just had to keep on thinking, if they're going to do this, how am I going to react to it? You know, And then I had to make sure that I trained my subordinates so that if anything happened to me, they could take over. Because that's what happens in combat in a military unit. The United States is somewhat unique in that regard because we train our, that's why our non-commissioned officers are so important. When the officers get wounded, uh, the non-commissioned officers are the ones who step up ones who step up. Unlike other armies where they depend so much on the officers that if you can eliminate the officers, the unit kind of falls apart. That doesn't happen in our army, either with, in any of our services. How did you feel when you were given your first badge and what did you do to earn it? How did I feel when I got my first badge and what did I do to earn it? My, the first badge that I got was my jump wings as a paratrooper. And uh, that was really cool, because uh, uh, the way you learn that, by the way, is you go through a three, and it's not that hard, really. You go through a three-week course, and there's a lot of physical running, and a lot of push-ups, and a lot of <laughs> stuff like that. But uh, the fun part is when you get to jump out of the airplane. And, uh, and I might add, the airplanes are, are uh, I, I, I won't say that they're not uh, they're not like your commercial airplanes. Let me just put it that way. And once you get up there and you're flying for a while, you just want to jump out. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but uh, that you, you have to you have to get five jumps to be qualified, okay, at jump school. So the most important jump is the fourth jump. And the reason that's the most important one is if you do the fourth one. You're going to get your wings because you're going to have a fifth jump. Even if you get injured on that last jump, you'll have completed five jumps. So you get your wings. So the most important thing is the fourth, the fourth jump. And uh, I that was my, I, I that was my first badge, and that was uh, something to be very proud of. What did you do if you disagree with orders from the superior? If it was if it was something that put my soldiers in jeopardy, okay, I would I would go to my commander and I would tell him. And now I would do it very respectfully, okay? Now, the thing about the military, you have to understand, is that commanders know the whole picture, quote unquote, the big picture, okay? There are a lot of things that they know that the people below them are not aware of. And so they make their decisions the best they can based on the total knowledge. Sometimes when we're down on the ground, ground level, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to us, okay? But you can go to a commander and you can be respectful and, and you can give him or her your opinion, but once you've given them your opinion and they've made a decision, then you've got to support it.
The Arlington Tones are going to sing another song. Oh, beautiful for My name is Jim Corsi. I served 1960 to 66 U.S. Navy as a third class electronic spending officer. My name is Elmer Sweet, and I served in the United States Navy as an air intelligence officer. My name is Bob McKillop. I served 27 years in the U.S. Air Force as a pilot. I'm Matthew Hahn, and I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. My name is Bill Dempsey. I was in the U.S. Army in 4546. My name is Otto Ryle. I served with the United States Navy. I'm John Sloss. I served with the U.S. Army in 1996 and 1999. I'm Al Scheifler, a Navy Lieutenant, a heavy attack squadron lieutenant. My name is Jack Sturgeon, and I served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Bob Henderson, and I served in Korea in 1952 and 1953. My name is John McDermott, United States Marine Corps, 1943 to 1946. My name is George Miskos, I served in the U.S. Navy, 1943 to 1946. Very successful. I served on a destroyer. During the Korean War, Gunnery Officer. My name is John Schmidt. I retired from the United States Air Force as Colonel after 38 years. John Cordet, I served six years in the U.S. Air Force. John Nicholas I served for three years in the Armored Division. My name is Carl Palmer. I served in the U.S. Navy, Petty Officer, aboard the USS Davidson, EMS 37. Wayne Larson, U.S. Marine Corps, 1948 to 52. Rob Studi, I was in the Army uh, Air Force. Mario Bartley. On a special note, I want to let you guys know, right here, 
Wayne Larson and Sergeant Marine. This is my grandfather right here. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, to our veterans, I know I said this to you before, but I'll say it again. Thank you so much for your service to our country. Just thank you for providing a safe place for us um, so that we can live the type of life that we live. So if you could just stand up and give our veterans one more big round of applause. Amen. 